Everyone, I am not Christian Harloff. Grand Moff Nemiroff. Yay! Yeah, Darth Harloff is too busy eating pokey nachos at Yard House today, so he put me in charge. I'm very honored, also semi-mortified, but thankfully I've got a really good group with me today. Mark 2D2 over there is going to be reading the stories. Damn right I'm here because I don't eat pokey nachos because nachos were made for <laughs> cheese and some sort of farm animal, not pokey. And of course, I can always count on Jeremy John Solo. Oh, that's for me everything. right here. Oh, thank you very much, Perry. I'm actually I'm in the middle. I'm in the center of the table, but I'm not hosting the show. This is how I feel like I have power without taking on the responsibilities of power. He's got to look both ways simultaneously. He can't. It's gonna do be it. crazy. Oh yeah, I do have to split a little bit. I can make my eyes do that. Hold on. <laughs> I can't. Thank you. I'm collecting for blooper reel while I'm here, so that's wonderful. Hope Earl got that one. All right, so we had a little bit of a slow news week this week, but fortunately, a few stories dropped after we created our show notes. So let's kick the show off with that. Mark, what we got? Uh, Dave Filoni is talking the end of Star Wars Rebels and more specifically, the clarification, if you will, possibly of the fate of Ahsoka Tano. The beloved character has been rumored to be appearing in Rebels and other canon all over the place, and he just debunked a theory that was made popular by uh, Peter Shredder, our buddy, and who thought that maybe that Ahsoka Tano would take on the properties of a certain wolf, and then Dave Filoni had a tweet for his birthday, they'd kind of said, okay, nah, she's not the wolf. However, there's been a lot of Ahsoka theories going around, and Dave Filoni, first of all, doesn't have the time in his day to debunk every theory, but it seems like he went after this one particularly without really mentioning if any of the other theories have any credibility. It was a really nice theory that Peter put together. Perry, do you buy into the fact that this, in fact, is not the fate of Ahsoka? Yeah, no, I definitely buy into it, but I, you know, I respect Peter for kind of connecting the dots that way because we can't help but to do it and, you know, Filoni kind of fueled the fire by doing the, sh the shirt change at Star Wars Celebration because when you do that, even though it's a teeny tiny, tiny detail, that room is packed with thousands of people. Everybody is going to latch on to it. Every, a lot of people really love Ahsoka. I love Ahsoka. So any chance I have of discovering a little something more about what's to come for that character... I kind of bought into what he said, and the whole animal transition thing, transformation thing, it does seem kind of possible. It's something that we've not really like dove into at all, yet in the Star Wars realm, it, it wouldn't be that much of a stretch, especially because the converse, what are the, do you know what the birds are called? Uh, they're called flight people. Yeah, those. Uh, we've been talking a lot about the birds. Those are part of a lot of theories that are going around now, and I kind of like that idea, but one way or the other, Ahsoka better be back. Uh, I, I don't know. Jeremy, what are you thinking? Oh, Ahsoka's definitely going to be back. Now, uh, fill me in here as someone who hasn't seen season three of Rebels. The last time we saw Ahsoka is when she was clashing with, uh, with mm -hmm. one Lord Vader. That was the last time, and then no one knows what happened. It's in season three, there was no Ahsoka Tana at all. Maybe the owls know. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, uh, all right. So, you guys didn't watch season three either. All right. Cool. <laughs> no, no, no. We're familiar with season three, but no, you did not see her. So, okay, everybody's so, wondering is she going to come back? So, to where, the does final she, season? where does she go? I, I believe she'll come back in the final season because it would be a real shame to have that character in Clone Wars and then have her in Rebels and have everyone be like, yeah, she's in Rebels and then not use her at all. I mean, you can use her in other canonical properties, but to only do that and not have her in Rebels, I, I think would, uh, th that. That wouldn't be the way to go. So we're going to see her back. Very, I'm very sure. Yeah, I, I think so as well, Perry, because you you have Filoni who just gets inundated with these theories all the time. And at Celebration, it was really cool what he did because he had a shirt that said Ahsoka Lives, question mark. Then they ran a trailer for season four of Rebels. Then when it came back, it said Ahsoka Lives, and the question mark was gone, mm -hmm. an exclamation point was there. And the crowd noticed that, and it was just kind of like a rolling like applause like yeah. as more people started to figure out exactly what the difference in the shirt was and it's weird that that came on the heels of showing a trailer and a snippet of season four so we start speculating in that vein and whether it's a wolf or it's an owl or it's just actually her in her normal form that we already know the character from i think that you would want to have it in rebels but there is some credence to the theories that say she's not going to return because Star Wars loves to leave some mysteries unsolved. They love to leave some things not turned. And you only have a finite amount of time to tell stories in the Rebels universe because they announced that this is the last season. So there's so many loose ends to tie up already. Do you think that they can actually pile on the Ahsoka one on top of that? I would be very disappointed if... Because mm -hmm. I, I like mysteries. I also... I'm just a very logical person. I like things explained and I like the satisfaction it comes with 
forth with solving a mystery in the end. Ahsoka is a different situation, though, because when Ahsoka first came on the scene, she she was not liked all that much and then she became just this crazy fan favorite and I feel like you don't have because that's not an easy thing to do the level of I guess I could kind of use the word hate some felt towards early renditions of ah Ahsoka and then she kind of I mean it's like fanatical and I can understand why it's a great character and it would be a shame for someone to have made that kind of transition just for it to wind up being some sort of unsolved mystery. And it feels like, especially given how good she is in the book, like even even though that takes place before Rebels, there's so many layers to that character that are so that are well, well worth exploring. And she feels so I mean, she was the big character in Clone Wars, but she's pretty damn important to everybody in Rebels, all the storylines in Rebels. I think it'd be a shame to wrap up the show and not not necessarily wrap up her situation, but at least address it. Yeah, there, there's a difference between leaving mystery in a universe and totally losting somebody. <laughs> like, off fans. Yeah, right. <laughs> you can leave mystery. I love it when a show doesn't give you confirmation. You just kind of have to connect the dots. You're like, no, they never actually said X, y, X and Y equals Z. But if you look at it, you're like, yeah, it does, though. But if they just, the last thing you see is a door shutting and she's going into a battle and that's the last you see of her, that's not the justice we want. And I agree that they, they should give resolution for the fan's sake on Ahsoka's storyline because just, just to be like, well, what happened happened isn't good enough. <laughs> not in this situation. It's also one of the best episodes of Rebels we've it's, ever it, got. It's actually what got me to watch Rebels. It's I hadn't so watched good. Rebels and I was like, oh, season finale too, sure. Huh. And then I watched it and I'm like, oh my God, I need to watch this like right now because it was so Super, super epic. And yeah, so that got me actually to go back and watch Clone Wars leading up to Rebels because I was like, I feel like I should know a little bit about that, a little bit about that character. So I did. Uh, it was time well spent, but it's very rare that one episode can do that for mm -hmm. a show, you know, so. Changes everything. Mm -hmm. You know what else is going to change everything? Our second story right now. That's oh. how you do it. What is it, Mark? Yeah. <laughs> Kids, get the car. We're going to Disneyland yeah. because Star Wars Land is opening. We're going to be sitting in our car for two years. However, we're going to get new details on exactly what we get to experience once it finally opens in the year 2019, thanks to new details at D23 this summer. The convention takes place the week before Comic-Con, and we're going to get some new looks, some first glances at some of the attractions that will be inside Star Wars land. There's actually going to be like its own standalone thing at D23, so if you walk in there, you're lucky enough to be at D23, you can actually check out what it's going to look like eventually. Eventually, Perry, are you ferving at the mouth? Not just, are you frothing not just for the actual Star Wars land, but for the new details of Star Wars land that will come out this summer? I hope I can put words in a sentence right now because the only thing that I love almost as much as movies, freaking theme parks. I love <laughs> Disney World and Disneyland with all my heart. If you combine those two things with Star Wars, I am going to be broke. And as we've established on previous episodes of this, I'm already kind of broke thanks to Star Wars. But when I went with Wendy to Disneyland for that Guardians ride, I mean, if you drive past it, you see just so much construction out there. This thing is just going to be epic. I mean, already right now, when you think about the lot, like, all right, to use Guardians for an example again. That ride is brand new, and it's got something like a three to five hour wait. Can you imagine the foot traffic in these two parks when Star Wars arrives? It's going to be insane, and I'm going to do everything in my power to get there to experience it all. The thing with this story is I'm really bummed that I'm not going to D23. I mean, stupid sister is to get married, and I have to go to her bachelor party when I'd rather go <laughs> you give that to D23. But I am so excited to hear all the details that are coming out of this. And that logo, that logo is great, too. And I found it really interesting that they decided to call it, uh, it says on the uh, the logo, Walt Disney Parks and Resorts, A Galaxy of Stories. Ah, I see what they did. I find it really refreshing that they're not calling it Star Wars Land, because even though that is a very easy thing to say right off the bat when you're talking about a new part of a park, that opens up the door to, to many possibilities, and it kind of paves the way to the original vision that they had for the park at the beginning, which is you go in there and you get to experience Star Wars. You get to feel like you're right in there. And if there are story elements that you could feel part of, this could be, I mean, really one of the best editions of uh, Disney. You into it, Jeremy? <laughs> I am into it. You know, I'm like you. I love theme parks. Here's what you do. You get your annual pass, and it doesn't actually cost you more money to go there. I have myself a Disneyland <sighs> annual pass. Perry, you got to get on I it. Know. you got to get on you that train. You don't have one, Perry? 
Yeah, you know, everything you know be the first I'm, one. I'm a little ashamed. First thing I did when I moved here was I did get one. And you didn't go? Well, the only time I was ever free to go yeah. was when uh, they didn't, was when the blackout dates happened. Yeah, so it's yeah. like I got the pass and then I might have paid one or two times oh, to really? go when I wasn't supposed Here, to you go. Get, you get the pass that has no blackout dates. She's going to full bankruptcy. You have the, I know you have the fancy pass. No, you, you, people, but people don't know. A lot happens here in the world of the Collider <laughs> building. There's not a lot of free time. But uh, no, I mean, A Galaxy of Stories, it being the, be, be in the title, I do like how it is like, ooh, here's the story of a galaxy. The fact that they didn't call it A Galaxy of Stories far, far away. That's a little misleading because they are from <laughs> far, far away. I mean, my gosh, guys, I would, I would be a simple and colored Star Wars land just because I don't have Star Wars in the title. But the point is, you're completely right. When you park in this parking lot, you look over, and it is a crater and cranes. It's construction. It looks like the Death Star came over, cleared out a hole for someone to start building stuff. Like, there you go. There's your Star Wars land. And now they've been building ever since. But every time I go there and you look over and you see those cranes, you're like, something's going to happen here. Yeah, it's one of the right many reasons there. to ride Thunder Mountain is so you can go up and you can see like <laughs> what the development has right, been. Right. But as far as Star Wars land opening in 2019 and having new details, once it opens, there's never been a better time to get on the Who Framed Roger Rabbit ride. Oh, that line is, is that still around? Shrunk. It's awesome, too. Is it still around? It's a around? lot of fun. It's a lot of twisting and turning. It's like teacups on acid. <laughs> you are not gonna have to wait that long for this, but this Star Wars Land thing is just gonna be a monstrosity of humans. That's what I'm worried about. The name, a galaxy of Star I don't care. I, I really don't care. Everybody's gonna be calling it Star Wars Land anyway, yeah. so it really doesn't matter what you call it. I'm sure that planet is gonna have some sort of name because according to our sources, it's some sort of outer rim planet, and the design is you feel like you're on like a, a Moss Icely spaceport-ish mm -hmm. area of this planet that's far, far away. So it sounds like a really neat premise. I'm looking forward to the new details at D23. Three. It's just like, you know, I, I, I it use a little bit of caution anytime I get too excited about going to a theme park where I know a lot of other people are going to be, everybody rushing in there. I just wonder how you have all those people get in and get out to where each human being can still oh, yeah. enjoy the experience a little bit. Yeah, there's going to be a fatality or two for oh, sure. Yeah. Let's right. be real about that. There's going to be some crowds. There's going to be some trampling. I joke, Perry. I really do <laughs> joke. You should have seen her face. She was like, oh, my. I didn't oh, expect my you word. to get that dark. Oh, man. <laughs> it gets dark over here. But you do raise a good point about the crowds is that Tomorrowland was a dead space, really. You look at anywhere else in Disneyland, it was always more packed than Tomorrowland. Then they kind of Star Warsified Tomorrowland, and now Tomorrowland is clearly the most packed. So if you take that, exponentially stack it, create an entire land around what made people go to Tomorrowland now, yeah, that those weights are going to be brutal. Just yeah. brutal. It's Here. gonna it's gonna be brutal, but you know, like with any new thing, eventually it it has to calm down a little, right? No. <laughs> just, just <laughs> Star Wars as, never as those words down. dribbled out of yeah, my yeah, mouth, like, I'm uh, like, uh, <laughs> this is yeah. probably wrong. No, it's uh, I mean, see, Star Wars. I mean, let's take it. Star Wars was you know huge seventies through the eighties, and then it started to calm down somewhere in the nineties. So you give it ten or twenty years, it, it might. Yeah. The point is, you just go and you go on all the rides right after the holidays, like right after, uh, <laughs> no, right just, after New uh, Year's, the first and second uh, week in January. That's when you go to a Disney park. There should be a whole collider <laughs> series on, like, you know, how to hack getting into Disneyland yeah. the right way. If I can help with some of that. Yeah, right. You should do it. You should totally because if it, well, if the, it's raining, the real hack, if you have the motivation, is to run a Disney race. Because those races, especially, I see, see what, see what did I did there? there? But yeah. seriously, the, the Run Disney Marathon weekend in, in a Disney World in Florida is always right after the holiday season. So it's like you get the whole package that comes with doing a race, and then the park is kind of quiet other than the marathon. I run right to the Dole Whip. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> so does my sister-in-law. It's time. really good. It's She's tough. like, we have to get Dole Whip. I'm like, that. no, not that one. That one. I'm like, <laughs> let's go get some Dole Whip. The Dole Whip hype is real. I can confirm that. All right, let's move on to our first official story of the show in the movie news section of the show. And we get to talk about everything Star Wars that relates to the cinematic universe. It's not a cinematic universe. That's something else. Star Wars, I don't know. It's kind of a cinematic universe. It now, is a cinematic universe. It's just sequels. every time I say cinematic universe, my eyes roll a little, and I don't want to do that to... <laughs> Actually, yeah. You don't yeah. want to do that to I don't to want to yourself. do that to Star Wars. <laughs> but Dare we say it's even a cosmic universe. Well, well the then. first news story out of that galaxy far, far away 
in pertaining to the movies anyway, is that The Last Jedi is coming out. We haven't seen it yet. Guess what? They're making a sequel. It's called Episode Nine right now, and the director, Colin Trevorrow, was recently interviewed by Cinema Blend on the very difficult subject about Carrie Fisher's recent passing and how Lucasfilm and Disney plan on handling the absence. And Trevorrow was honest about it. He said she's a major character. She really was, and it's very sad because she was so loved by the Star Wars family and everyone that worked with her. As far as the character of General Leia in Episode Nine, he was blunt. He said, I feel like our options are limited, mostly by ourselves, since there's only certain things that they're willing to do. But he did say it will be handled with love and respect and all the soul that Carrie Fisher deserves. So, Perry, you hear these comments by Colin Trevorrow, and it's in line with what we've heard from Disney and Lucasfilm about how we're not going to uh, necessarily do a whole lot of CGI, what they did with Tarkin, and they're not going to recast the character. What direction do you think they go in? I wish I had an answer to that. I I don't envy Colin Trevorrow right now and the whole team with having to deal with the changes that come with such a tragedy, but it is really nice to hear him address the situation like he does. It feels like a very honest quote to me and not something that is a stock response that some sort of Disney rep said, don't go outside these lines. I mean, especially when he points out, I feel like our options are limited. And then he says mostly by ourselves. I should clarify that, but... It's true. Their their options are limited. There's a certain line you can cross in terms of being respectful. And then they also have to respect the story that they've set up and they've shot a good deal of. They're in an almost impossible situation. But if anyone's going to come out of an impossible situation like this on top, I really do think it's the team at Lucasfilm. And I think it's these filmmakers because they clearly understand how to navigate this and how to navigate it well in a way that is both respectful to family and and real people that are part of her lives and also the fans who deeply care about Carrie Fisher as a person, deeply care about this character, want to see this character have have her big finish because that's one thing that I don't think they can do. They're not going to address the loss of this character in an opening crawl. They're not going to address it off screen. Something has to be done to make it feel like a proper finish or that is going to be wrong and that's going to be crossing the line in a different way. So I don't know what they're going to come up with, but I'm leaving it in their hands. I, for one, am against them recasting the role. I know some people are kind of rooting for that just so that Leia can have her big finish or at least be part of some of the story that they had laid out prior to this. I I don't know if that will sit right with me, but again, it just goes back to trusting the people in charge, and in this situation, I think everything is in good hands. What do you think, Alice? I think that it's very hard to get, to separate the actress Carrie Fisher from the role of Leia, and if you're able to do that, and that's a very daunting task if you recast it with any actress, but if you need that to give the character the send-off that she does deserve, then I think that recasting is certainly an option you should look at. At the end of the day, I'm going to be cool with whatever they do um, or don't do. Um, but it's it's something where, I mean, Han Solo is no longer alive, and we had Harrison Ford, to, and, and we could set up that shot any way we wanted multiple times, and people still don't feel satisfied with it. So it's a very hard thing to do. I love the point you made where you can't just address the passing of General Leia in a crawl text or off screen. You know, no, no, we're, we're not going to be getting some sort of space telegram with the bad news. It's going to happen on screen if General Leia does, in fact, pass away. We don't even know if that was the original plan. I mean, I think it'd be great to be able to execute the plan that they already had. And even if that involves recasting Leia, I think that that might be the right play. I'm starting to lean that way. Where yeah. do you fall on this? I, I do. <laughs> I feel like I'm like, I, I don't want to choose something. Give me an answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I lean with Ellis that the character of uh, General Leia does transcend the uh, the actress of, of General Leia. I, I would think that Carrie Fisher would want whatever's best for the character, you know? I mean, that, that's what I think. And uh, I, I think in that, recasting is not off the table with me. I agree with you. When you see someone else, you're like, no. And But... I always find that by the end of a movie, I, I'm I walk out of the movie going, 
all right, they did a good job with it. You know what I mean? Like, no matter how resistant I am, when I walk out of it after it's been recast, I'm like, okay. Um, now, I mean, I, I've tossed this around in my head a hundred times. It could be a case of not in an opening crawl or anything, but let's say they have to go do the big thing, but they need uh, someone at Rebel Base to get this code through to stop something from doing X, Y, and Z, and then it happens. And they're like, oh, General Leia did it. And then you can they'll have some sort of tie-in book where they're like, this is what Leia was doing when episode nine was going down over here, here's her adventure, and it's every bit as relevant, every bit as real. And then when she does things, you can kind of see times like, oh, that's why that happened over there. It feels complete when you're watching the movie, but it just gives more context when you read it in the book. That's not to say her character goes out. If you can have her last through the entirety of episode nine, then you can keep Leia alive in literature. So they could do it that way. That is the good thing about the books. And it's, you know, I, I think that, a lot of people clearly are reading books and mm -hmm. comics and everything that exists outside this not cinematic universe, but the truth of the matter is most people watch the movies yeah. and they don't read the supplemental material, but I think Claudia Gray did such a great job writing for Leia in Bloodline. That is something that that could be an option mm -hmm. if they can't fully express the story for this character that they want to on screen. I'd be thrilled to hear that they recruit her to write another book. Mm -hmm. If they did that, Alice, would you read it? Uh, probably not. But is yeah. there? Is, is there? I, 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 look, I'm not, and it's not that I don't want to read because Claudia Gray is a great writer. It's just that I'm just I, I I'm not a big fan of audiobooks right now. And I don't have a lot of time to the read. The same so. conversation is always going to happen because I'm such a big fan of audiobooks. I know. You, you're one great day. at running marathons and listening to audiobooks, and I'm not. But one the, day I'll peer pressure you into one or the other. It's <laughs> like, it's just like so meaningful and powerful about this image that I can't get out of my head where if they had the character of General Leia and her natural story arc is to pass away sometime in episode eight or episode nine, is the last thing that you see is like the force ghost of Leia. And you were able to use some sort of footage that you shot at one point with Carrie Fisher. I think that would just be such a powerful hmm. going out for both Carrie in the heart of the Star Wars fans and the character of Leia. But remains to be seen. We just we just don't know. And I think that we're going to afford them a lot of leeway to do whatever they feel like they have to do to honor her and the character. Yeah, it's actually not a bad idea. Yeah, it's, it, and it's a lot of it's managing expectations. It's mm -hmm. like whatever happens will not be 100% perfect what you would ideally want. So there's going to have to be compromise in the eyes of the fans as well. All right, we got one more uh, movie news story. Alice, yeah, what is we it? do, and it's a big one. Biker Scouts and Han Solo, everybody. <laughs> we think there was some rogue footage shot of a stormtrooper that appeared to be one of the Biker Scouts, a lot like the ones you'll see in Return of the Jedi, the greatest Star Wars movie, on some sort of load lifter carrier thing. He is having some fun four-wheeling. Perry, we're going to see Biker Scouts and Han Solo. That's pretty exciting, right? I'm going to sound like a broken record, because I always say this when we see unofficial set photos from the Han Solo movie at this point, but I'm really excited for, for Biker Scouts or whatever this guy's going to be, but I don't want to see that. I don't want to see this thing with the stupid truck tires under it. It kind of completely <laughs> ruins the movie magic of it all. Not that my brain can't process the fact that I knew it was probably on wheels before, but oh, all right. Once I get past the fact that I'm pissed that they're paparazzi shooting the crap out of this movie... I like these vehicles. I like all the vehicles that I've seen from the Han Solo movie, and I think that's probably one of the most exciting parts about this thing is just how vehicle-heavy it's going to be, and we're going to see some new stuff. And I like the idea of that trooper having a different helmet, too. I'm obsessed with Mandalorian helmets and, uh, and trooper helmets, too, and... Here's another one to add to my collection that doesn't exist. Jeremy, what do you think about this? So, so what you're saying is, I mean, you know... We're all in agreement. Those tires are going to be CGI'd uh, out, and the thing's going to be flying. No. Oh, I imagine... I'm yeah, yeah, oh, but, I'm no, just no, messing yeah, yeah. with you. All right, so so, but when you watch it and it's floating, you're gonna see the tires. Is why you're pissed. Is is? I mean, and I'm not saying. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I do think about that. It's very difficult yeah, though, because you know we we do have to go into movies with. It's impossible not to go into any movie without you know your expectations and but what it, you know of the production, and it's it's impossible to make that completely vanish. We have to try, but yeah. at the same time, I'm fascinated yeah. by movie magic, so it's, I will think of this. It's like butterfly wings. It's like it's now been touched. Your mind has oh. been touched with the reality of the tires. Well, it now does it's look never like he's mowing. He's mowing a very big lawn. Is what he looks like. It's yeah, like Barry sees a stormtrooper 
remember mowing a lawn and she gets the image that most people have if they walk into their parents having sex. Like they can never <laughs> unsee this image of this thing. I'll, I'll tell you, that, I'm going the other way on this, is that I am rooting for whoever this young man or woman is in the Empire. I'm rooting for them because when you watch this video, this is not some agent of evil who is who's yeah. desirous to spread chaos. This is working man. He's just doing his job, Jeremy. I get he's it. Just doing it. Han Solo, you lay off this guy. He's just he's just doing a gig. He's making fifteen dollars an hour. Clearly, he's doing his job very poorly because he's ruined all the grass in that photo. Yeah, yeah, he's mowing the dirt. <laughs> That's what we learned. He's like, hey, uh, he's, he's like the, the Mars probe. He's just he's picking up rocks. And stuff. Yeah, it's like worst baseball field ever. <laughs> all right. Now that we've covered that very important story, oh, no, it's time. Yeah. It's Should I do it? Yes, you Wait, have to. Throw up the image so I don't feel too embarrassed. Ready? What's the deal with Canon? Was that not bad? That's pretty good. Kinda? Like all right. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. So now we're going to talk about all the Star Wars stories that are not part of the films, and we only have one. And lucky for you guys, none of us have read this comic. So Alice is going to tell you a little about it. The hotly anticipated issue number one of the Darth Vader comic. Ooh. We get to know more of Darth Vader's origin immediately after, and we're talking like right after the end of Revenge of the Sith when we see Darth Vader and he's created by Palpatine. This is where that comic picks up because Darth Vader is learning his place in this new suit that he's got, this new relationship he has with the Emperor because he's a little peeved at Sheev because she kind of misled him with the Padme stuff. Mm -hmm. So what is cool about this comic is that there's this fight that happens. We're not going to give away too many spoilers as the actual issue, but that Darth Vader is not happy. So it's not just like he's subservient, like, okay, tell me what our first task is. Where are we, are we getting lunch somewhere? No. He's like, dude, you lied to me, and he uses some force against Sheev, and then Sheev uses some force <laughs> back against Vader. So they're going to become simpatico, but it ain't at the outset of this comic. Are you on a first-name basis with the Emperor at this point? Are you calling we, him Sheev? We play cards. <laughs> that was a pretty good description, though. You kind of make me want to read this comic. It's For interesting sure. because, because it picks up right, like literally right after Revenge of the Sith, because... When you have a Vader comic and you're getting the Vader origin story, you want to know about the lightsaber. You're going to find out more about mm -hmm. that. This whole kyber crystal bleeding thing, which is something that I was pretty cool with, like right off the bat, that I know some other council members were not as cool with. I think it's neat that a kyber crystal can kind of sense mm -hmm. if you're good or you're bad. And if you pick up a kyber crystal, it starts turning red. Oh, boy, I guess I'm an evil guy. The creation of his lightsaber, all that stuff, you're going to get more into the origins. Now, I'm a guy that kind of likes a little bit of mystery, especially when it comes to Darth Vader, because they've explored his mythology so much. But this comic, as of right now, is actually pretty intriguing to me. Are you yeah. going to read it? Yeah, yeah. I'm the thing I like about uh, Marvel is that they're pretty quick on their trades. There are other companies out there when about five issues are in the trade paperbacks that you can just sit down and read. It's usually a full arc that you can enjoy. Uh, there's some other comic book companies that are like, you'll get the trade in about nine months, but M M Marvel is pretty good about their trades. And when the last one comes out, I mean, you know, a few months from now, I can get the trade. Uh, but I agree that I love the fact that Darth Vader's mythology is being explored, though it's been explored a lot. So it's all about explore the important and intriguing parts. The kyber crystal thing I like, but I want to know why it wasn't red when he was fighting Obi-Wan on Mustafar. Will it at least explain that? Which also brings to the point that a lot of these side properties, these literary properties, and even the new movies, the TV shows, they've had to do a little bit of damage control where they're like, all right, not everyone was pleased with the prequel. Sometimes it conflicted with some of the mythology. So we have to really flesh it out. Like that was one of my thoughts was why didn't Vader literally just try to whip Palpatine down when he realized like, wait a minute, you can't bring my wife back to life. Like, why is he serving this guy? And the fact that it's even exploring that is them answering a question and at least putting that to rest in the eyes of the fans. So I do love that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to reading more of that mentality. I mean, that is if I get these comics. I mean, I've said it before on Jedi. Part of my problem with the comics is, again, I'm already spending so much money and it, it's very difficult to keep up with all yeah. the comics. Trades. But, you know, the trades. The thought of starting right at the beginning with one of them, because I was trying to play catch up with quite a few and... It was a problem, and I had to stop doing that. But maybe I will start with this one because Lords of the Sith is also one of my favorite books that I've read. And the relationship between Vader and Palpatine and that, 
that's something that I want to learn more about. And that's something that something like this could start planting the seeds for. And I liked it so much there that I think this could have some of that in it. And the stuff with the Kyber crystal, that's what I think that they should be using this opportunity for is to fill in, you know, certain mythology holes so that we could start using that little bit of information and applying it to uh, maybe Ahsoka in, in Rebels and Clone Wars and her lightsaber or things that we can bring over into the movies. And the Kyber crystal thing is, is probably one of my favorite little details. I don't know. Why, why do people not like that? I just think, I think sometimes people get a little uh, hands off when it's science in Star Wars, whether it's mini chlorians or it's like, this is the scientific reason for this to happen. And the Kyber crystal thing, it's a little bit of a spiritual sensing too, but there is a science a biological element. And I think so. And, and even like me, like I don't need to get lost in the minutia and the details of all things Star Wars related. I just happen to think this particular little trick is you always kind of wonder why people have different colored lightsabers. Yeah. It's neat. What I actually, and it's weird to hear me say this, is that I'd actually be more up for reading this comic than I would be seeing a Darth Vader origin story on the big screen because I hate seeing Darth Vader vulnerable. I, I mm. cannot stand it. It's why I think Revenge of the Sith was totally compromised at the end by seeing him yearn for something. I hate that. I know that Darth Vader in his day-to-day -day life probably acts like just another person. He probably reads on the toilet. He probably gets hungry. He probably has trouble figuring out how to get the straw through the thing. But I don't want to see that. I just want to see him be this all-powerful Sith on screen. So if you have to get into some of this details, I'll take it in reading form. There's different kinds of vulnerability, though, because you see that a little in Lords of the Sith, but it's not so much like I am weak and, and, yeah. and doubtful in the way that it makes him seem weak. He kind of just assesses and reassesses where he is, where it, it's not vulnerability, but it's just being a little unsure and being in a position where you need to make important decisions, if that makes any sense. So it's not something that... that you know, makes him seem weak. No, yeah, it just it, it humanizes him is what yeah. you don't like about it. Like, because Darth Vader is in the mythos. You know, he 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 is an entity. He is he he's he's larger than life. And when you see like it, it's like if you see a boss, if you see someone eat, if innately you see a celebrity eat, you're like, oh, they're a human being. Like you know, just like me. Or you know what I mean? So like I I I saw that I knew this one boss. This dude. It was in retail management, so this dude literally has delusions of grandeur innately, but he wouldn't let any of the employees see him eat his food because it humanizes it. Yeah, there's certain <laughs> things you don't order on a first date, okay? If, if you're eating a particularly sloppy food, look, Bradley Cooper struggles eating salad sometimes, okay? We don't see that because he's just this huge movie star, but we, I don't know why I picked Bradley Cooper, but uh, <laughs> it's just, it's something that I don't need to see because they did it so well when they were bringing Vader back from machine into this old, you know, wrinkled human being. I thought that was done so well in Return of the Jedi. Its praises don't get sung enough, but to see him become the bad ass that is Vader and still be like, hey, where's Padme? Is she okay? Like, I just don't like the storyline that you're walking down there. If she was okay, what are you doing? Are you going to go home to her? Hey, honey, you like the new outfit? I just, I don't like getting lost in those mundane details. That's the, that's the challenge of, of writing for pre-existing iconic characters, is addressing, okay? addressing things like that in a way that suits who you knew they were before. You'll so. see Padme? She, she okay? Because <laughs> that's, because that's, well, Exactly oh, no. is, is, she, is she okay? Is, is she all right? <laughs> He's like, no, you killed her, idiot. Oh, That's good stuff. Oh, man. If I learned anything from this conversation, it's that I'm going to keep eating messy foods on first dates because if they don't like how I eat my food, then screw them. <laughs> all right. 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 We're going to move on to the bulk of our show. Like I said earlier, it was a little bit of a light news week, so that just means we're going to have time to take more of your Twitter questions. If you want your Twitter questions read here on the show, just use the Collider Jedi Council hashtag, and maybe we'll pick them for next week's show. Right now, we got a whole bunch to go through, and I like quite a few of them. Ellis, what's our first one? Darth Fildo kicks us off, and he says, where's Padme? No, he says, what are your thoughts on a Leia movie set before Rogue One starring Millie Bobby mm. Brown and directed by Patty Jenkins? Okay, so there's three parts to this question. One is a Leia movie set before Rogue One. I kind of like that idea. I like that idea. Clearly, she is, I mean, she's pivotal to what started it all, the very first movie. And that's a very specific position to be in, both just in terms of the action of that sequence, her mind frame, what it must have been like at that point. I think, right, not even necessarily the events leading up to 
what we see in Rogue One that then leads obviously into uh, Ep 4, even just the years before, like how she went from being, you know, an adopted child in a family to how she grew into the person that she is and, you know, and also her lineage, not knowing it, and then how that affected her growing up and how her family dealt with all that. So there is just so much great material to mine in that time frame. Millie Bobby Brown is number two. I like Millie Bobby Brown. I like saying her name. I like Stranger Things. <laughs> I need to see her in something else really, really badly. And I know she's got the Godzilla movie coming up and perhaps that could be it. But I'm, I think, I really do believe she's a very talented actress. There's certain things that she did in Stranger Things that exhibited a very natural ability and a range that I think does prove that she has real talent. It wasn't just a fluke, but at the same time, this would be one heck of an undertaking for a young actress. I need to see something else. I need to see that she's kind of, you know, in it for the long run and she can hold up to that kind of pressure that would be put on her should she get a role like this. Number three is Patty Jenkins. Yes. Yes, please. <laughs> if I took anything away from Wonder Woman, it is the fact that Patty Jenkins can direct a movie about a female hero, go into it completely understanding who her main character is, completely understanding how best to put her in the world around her, where, you know, one, one of my favorite things about Wonder Woman was that it was just hyper-focused on its title character. It took the time to build her in the right way, which is why the movie is so impactful, because you fall in love with Wonder Woman, and you really, you are worried about her from start to finish. You want to see her save the day and all that. And and that that is what this needs, but she also does it in a way where it's not like it brushes everything else to the side. She understood how to use the characters around Wonder Woman to not only better suit Wonder Woman herself, but also to create memorable supporting characters to fill out the cast too. So I'm pretty sure that Patty Jenkins, Patty Jenkins could direct the crap out of anything. She would be very well suited for a Leia movie, though. Ellis, what do you think? Uh, I'd be when you just look at the broad picture here. Is Patty Jenkins directing a Star Wars movie? Hell yes! I'm sure that the good people at Lucasfilm and Kathleen Kennedy already know and are clearly aware that us fans are clamoring to have a female-directed Star Wars movie. It's overdue. I would love to see Patty Jenkins do it. I know they've been eyeing Ava DuVernay for projects too. Mm -hmm. Maybe she's the first one to do it. I'd love to have multiple women direct stories in the Star Wars universe. As far as a Leia movie, I, it's it's not the one on the top of my list simply because I get worried about showing us too much. Mm -hmm. Having said that, this is an interesting prospect because how did Leia go from being a child into being somebody very young and precocious in this giant war that she was thrown into? Because she is a leader and a badass when we meet her in A New Hope and at the end of Rogue One. You can tell she's in charge, you know? We, we stole the plans. We don't care what that person or that guy thinks about it. We care what she says, and she says this represents hope. That's good enough for the rest of us. So I'd like to see how she got there. I just, Millie, Millie Bobby Brown is somebody who I'm very excited to see where her career career goes and if she's going to be in the star wars universe i might prefer to have her be her own character mm -hmm. jeremy actually uh, very well said uh, of the three things uh, um patty jenkins yep leia movie i agree i'm 50 50 on because i do like mystery with my characters as well but there's a lot to know about just like where she came from when did she find out she was adopted did she know forever was there contention like wait you mean you're not my parents how did that happen who are my parents did she get a lie like luke skywalker got a lie uh had to have uh, had to have been so uh, th there's a lot to be told there. Millie Bobby Brown, I also agree she's, she's good in Stranger Things, but it is a definite tone for a character, whereas Leia is a bit more snarky and, and, and can verbally go up with some of the best of them and shoot out some of the insults. And she, she has a bit of a liveliness to her that um, Eleven in Stranger Things didn't have. She was still a bit more damaged and a bit more somber, you know? So, so definitely different tones. I feel like... A leap of faith would say Millie Bobby Brown could pull it off, but that's also a leap of faith, not a leap of fact and data. So I'd like to see something else. So, I mean, is there a better choice? I don't have one, so we'll see you what You mentioned happens. being able to verbally spar with people twice their yeah. age. I think we should cast Cash Me Outside Girl as the new young Leia. Who? Catch me outside. Oh, dude! Come on, <laughs> we're man. both over here like everybody. Yeah, everybody out man, there the knows one. what I'm talking yeah, about. No, no, no. You know what? Yeah, hashtag para me over here. Doesn't right. we're like, gosh, oh, sure. If you guys don't like that comment, you catch me outside. All right, our next Twitter. I can't believe you guys didn't pick that up. Is from Derek Richardson, who says, "Do you think Cad Bane or Hondo will be in the Han Solo film?" Ah. 
I wouldn't mind seeing uh, Cad Bane in it. Mm -hmm. I think maybe there's a way for that to make sense. I'm not really processing right now what would make sense in terms of timeline, if it's possible. It's, it's certainly it possible. It is possible. I mean, you know, Cad Bane had a lot of experiences during the Clone Wars after Jango yeah. Fett got off, but he also had run-ins with Boba Fett, I believe. So I think the timeline makes sense for both characters. Um, if I was going to put a percentage on it, I think that because they know the fans love this stuff, you're going to have at least a cameo. And maybe it's not even mentioned. Maybe it's not like, oh, that was Cad Bane. Maybe it's just like something that, that comes out mm. later when during some sort of director commentary on the right. blue where it's like, oh, you see that guy in the corner? That was Cad Bane. I wouldn't mind but seeing that. Hondo, you, you have good odds on too because mm. Hondo, it's, a, it's an Outer Rim pirate and we know that the Han Solo movie is going to take us to new places where Han Solo is going to have some sort of zany, crazy cannonball run adventure and maybe Maybe that's on an outer rim territory where he drives past Hondo. Yeah, Hondo, Hondo bugs me a little. So if I'm picking okay. between, you know, which character I'd like to see, it'd be Cad Bane. And as most of you know, I've yet to finish Clone Wars, but I have gotten up to my Cad Bane episodes, and he just looks freaking awesome. That's the kind of character design that I want to see a Star Wars filmmaker bring to screen. So. Mm -hmm. I would hope it would be him, although, you know, I mean, there's clearly design opportunities with Hondo's look, too. It's just I haven't really taken to Hondo quite like some other folks have. Jeremy, no, I, 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 I agree with you on that. If I had to pick, it would be Cad Bane. I could see it being something just like, ooh, in the background, like the ETs and Phantom Menace, but a little cooler than that, you know? Like, And even like in this world of technology, you're going to find out about it when a leak happens. Like opening day, we're going to find out that Cad Bane was in the background. The only problem is... That so ties together everything. Like a galaxy is a big, big place. The fact that these guys would even run across each other to be able to cameo is it's a bit far fetched at that point. Like, you know what I mean? Like we're all in the general LA area. I've never run across Christopher Nolan in my life. You know what I mean? Like you know why? Because it's a big place. Galaxies are bigger. But I would like to see Cad Bane in some capacity. Let's say their jobs you know, like intersect or cross each other. The United States is a big place, mm -hmm. but if you're a trucker, occasionally you stop at the same places. <laughs> you, you stop at a Flying J Travel Plaza, you get a shower <laughs> and a slice of Sbarro, and you say, hey, I mean, hey, okay, <laughs> we'll see you next time. It could happen. Or if okay. you work at Collider, everybody just crosses paths at Creation. No? No? I everybody does. I went to does. Creation today. Of and course got you did. A, uh, I got a wellness shot. And you shot brought me nothing. And a uh, chocolate lover's shake oh, with plant protein. I'm so freaking jealous. <laughs> he drinks his iced tea. <laughs> Our next Twitter question comes from Ryan, who says, Could the journal in the Last Jedi trailer actually be Obi-Wan's journal that Luke read in the comics? I want it to be. When, because uh, I hadn't read the comic that this journal is featured in, so naturally I saw this question came up and I Googled it, I probably shouldn't be telling people this just because it's probably not right. If you go on YouTube and you look up some of the comics, there's, there's, I wish I had written down the name now. There's one, there's one uh, YouTube channel that kind of performs the comics. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can hear everything and you can see some of the images as cool. it, it's just a, a surprisingly effective like that, way yeah. to tell a story, which probably isn't okay because I didn't buy the comic. I just heard the story there. But uh, what I heard, I did like quite a bit. And it would make a lot of sense if Luke, at this stage of his life, got a hold of that and was reading some of the things that Obi-Wan wrote while he was in isolation and trying to figure out who he was, what his duties were, because he uses words that are very similar to the state we see Luke in now. Like, th like things like being secluded and being a hermit and... To see, to get to see Luke process that in Ep Eight and apply that to his own life, and then to apply that to whatever his deal winds up being with Ray, I think that could only enhance Last Jedi. Ellis, what do you think about this one? I'd be up for whatever that is is in that book. If it's if it's Obi Wan's journal, if it's Yoda's journal, if it's uh, the menu at Chili's, I'm cool with Luke having it because. I think Luke actually and Kylo Ren are a little bit more similar than people might want to give them credit for because I think they're both fans of Jedi and Sith memorabilia, you know? <laughs> so I think after Luke burned his dad's body, he probably went around and explored a lot of different places in the galaxy and is like, oh, this is from that, this is from that. If you're trying to absorb as much as you can about the Jedi and the history of the Jedi, then he might have a lot of journals like that. So maybe it's Obi-Wan's journal. I'd actually be intrigued to see if it's his own journal that he kept or if it's a journal from way before the Phantom Menace era and it's a journal that he found that is somewhat of a relic that he keeps safely hidden inside a cave. If you found that journal, would you read it? 
Yeah. Yeah, I would read that one. <laughs> yeah. right. I wouldn't even need the audiobook. Just, I just I, I just read it. Just making sure. Yeah. Jeremy? It's a pretty thick book. I feel like it's the menu at Cheesecake Factory more than chili. That's a great <laughs> call. That's a, a great it's call. It's about that thick. Um, but I, uh, I, I think it's a journal from much farther in the past. Be, only because, not only because, but because that would lead some intrigue as to what he was looking for. He's mm-hmm. looking for something. And if you're looking for something in, on the path that Luke is, do you think you would feel like you have to go farther back than you learned? Learned. And uh, him having Obi Wan's journal, I don't know why he wouldn't just ask Obi Wan himself because his, I would assume his ghost still comes to him. He's still out there, you know. He's still one with the Force. So I feel like he'd be like, I can read that book. Or Obi Wan, what do you got to say? You know. So I, I feel like he could just do that and get it right from the source rather than a book. So I think it's a book from a much earlier time. I like all those ideas. All right, Alice, what's our next Twitter question? Uh, next up, uh, Christopher. Corcoran says, what heroes and villains from each era do you want to play as in Battlefront 2? I think I only care about one character right now, and clearly I'm obsessed with books. So it's, uh, how do you say her name? Uh, Iden Versio? The main the main character of Battlefront 2. Yeah. Versio, yeah. I, I really want to get my hands Inferno. on Inferno Squad. <laughs> that, that was very effective. <laughs> on Inferno Squad. I mean, I, I do, I've said it. I love the Imperial perspective, and I am just freaking over the moon about that book. I just have I have a very good feeling that the combination of that booking book coming out alongside that game is kind of going to you know, because I used to play a lot of games you know, when I was a little younger, and then for whatever reason I kind of stopped playing and I'm trying to I'm still trying to get better at Battlefront, but the idea of getting the story that we're gonna get in Battlefront 2 paired with that book my mind is just going to explode in Star Wars excitement and Imperial perspective. So hands down her above all else. I want that game for that reason. Jeremy. Uh, yeah, I don't know which of the heroes and the villains are actually in Battlefront 2 because I kind of keep my nose out of that uh, that rumor mill. I know that uh, the Force Awakens characters are in it, so Kylo Ren for sure. I got to think Darth Vader's in it, right? Like, is he I don't in th- it? I don't think there's a concrete list. I think people are just picking Who? potential heroes and villains based on whoever was shown in the trailer. I will always go with Darth Vader. Never underestimate the gratification that you feel when you are Darth Vader. I remember Battlefront 2, I would play as Hoth. You kill enough people, you become Darth Vader. And his first words are, <laughs> are like he's talking to somebody. He goes, this is Lord Vader. And it's singing the, the Battle of the Heroes song. Da, 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 da. And you go around and you just slice down rebel scum. It is the most fun you will have in your day. Go do it. I would like to play, uh, and first of all, you guys are uh, evil people yes. because you always yeah, go. Yeah, we all went bad. <laughs> Imperial <laughs> evil. And I'm always the way. guy that stumps for the good. I, I, I'm a Luke Skywalker guy, so I want to play as Luke Skywalker. Having said all that, there's one person I think I could play as. It might be a lot of fun to be Grievous. Like Grievous <laughs> with all the lights. Yeah, like, yeah. That might be really funny. You could just mow through people. So that would be my answer. And a lot of the characters in The Force Awakens, I think would be, it'd be fun to like fly as Poe Dameron. Uh, it'd be fun to be BB-8. Just roll around. It'd be cool. So um, the fact that you get to play Star Wars characters is a right and a privilege that we should not take for granted. All right. Let's see if we can get through the rest of these. What is our next one? Uh, Travisimo says... If for story, Leia had to be recasted, do you like Cherry Jones? She's not bad. I see like, it. Just looking at yeah. that picture, I'm like, that's not a bad call at all. So, I mean, even looking at her work and what she's been in, what she's done, I think she has it also. I'd be down for it. I see it, but I kind of stand by what I said before. And this could just be because, you know, we still are not all that far away yeah. from Carrie Fisher's passing, and I'm attached to the, her version of that character. Right now, at this point in time, I have a very difficult time mm-hmm. separating myself from Carrie Fisher's Leia. I, I don't see it. I don't see it working. It could change. Yeah, in a cold, emotionless vacuum, I could see it. Cherry Jones is really good from what I've seen of her on 24, but... Um, it's 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 tough. I, I could see that happening. If you had to go that route, I think that's a great option that you came up with. All Emotional right. attachment is the way to the dark side. Is that true? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, three more. Uh, let's do Andrew Lally next. We have Andrew Lally. Cody, hew it up. Give me the music. No music. Could existing scenes be incorporated into the new films like the Battle of Hoth 
from a fresh perspective. And Andrew was kind enough to screenshot <laughs> the Man of Steel I do like versus that. the I Batman do like v that Superman too. angle. I mean, I liked that in Batman versus Superman. Even when I saw it in the trailer, I was like, that's fascinating. I love in the Battlefront 2 trailer when she sees the Death Star blow mm -hmm. up, and you see this other part of the battle and their perspective of it. So we're starting to see that already. I would love to see more of that because if, if they're embracing one thing in the Star Wars universe, it is perspective. For anyone who has read Lost Stars, you know it can be very effective to fall in love with new characters and then see them go through some very familiar situations. So I think they should do this. Will they do it? I'm not entirely sure. I have a feeling the most we'll ever get of understanding something from another perspective, perspective might be what they did with uh, Bloodline and introducing one character who eventually we come to learn is on Hosni and Prime when it explodes. So that gives that moment when I watch Force Awakens now a little more value. <laughs> right. I just, I have a hard time picturing them replaying moments in film versus doing a moment that was featured in a film, in a book or a comic, or vice versa. Well, it looks like we're going to get that in The Last Jedi as far as the flashbacks go, because we might get an alternate look of, like, if you have a Force vision that you see in The Last Jedi, might be an alternate take as far as Luke watching the build, the, the, the burning of something mm -hmm. or so from that. But I, I don't think you're going to get, like, any, any huge flashback that is a different take, although I really like where your head's at, because I did not like that in Batman v Superman. I loved it. I thought <sighs> it was awesome. I thought that was one of the best parts of the movie. It's much better than the Martha part. I fell for that. I thought you were going to say you really didn't like yeah, it. Yeah, I yeah. think that was you one of my favorite too. parts of the movie. Mark Ellis creation rope a dope. <laughs> All right. What's our next one? Uh, MT says, what would be the perfect ending, in your own opinion, to the entire Star Wars saga? Whew. No ending. I'm, 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 I'm kind of not kidding. There, there's not going to be an ending, I hope, in, in my lifetime, at least. I mean, if as long as he's talking about the Star Wars saga, as in everything Star Wars, not a particular trilogy of films or someone's story or whatnot. I really, I really genuinely believe we're not going to see the end of Star Wars in our lifetime. I and mean, look at what we were talking about at the top of the show with this super expensive theme park that is going to make them an insane amount of money. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, from a business perspective, it's never, it's never going to go away. And then. I, again, I just have faith in all these filmmakers. I really do think that in the next few years, they're going to prove that while you can make more and more of the same thing, that same thing can also be done in very different ways where it's going to keep Star Wars fresh for years to come. It's going to be done in ways that can bring in new generations of fans. I mean, even um, Forces of Destiny, the thing that we're getting with the, uh, the animated series with the female leads. I mean, that's just a perfect example of how you can still exist in the Star Wars uh, franchise, but go right after a completely different viewership while actually also appealing to older viewers as well but this thing isn't going anywhere and also if i was to come up with some sort of perfect ending that I, that i don't think is possible uh i got good news and bad news what do you guys want first you're getting the good news the good news thanks is for that giving star me star wars <laughs> movies are going to continue to be made as long as there is a planet earth the bad news is probably only going to have earth for like 35 more years before all the natural resources <laughs> are used up and we can no longer breathe on this world so we best start making a star wars land on mars until that time oh yes you're going to get star wars movies i think i think the perfect ending at least for this new trilogy would be like look i want everybody to survive i want everybody to survive but if i had to have things play out the way they probably will i think it'd be really cool to see like a force ghost thing a lot like the end of return of the jedi except have a character like a ray or you know whoever it is or finn looking out and seeing the force ghost of your yodas your obi-wan your anakin your qui-gon luke Leia, if she passes away in this, like just having all of them hang out together as Force Ghosts and letting us know it's okay, they're still going to be with us right here. I think that'd be very powerful. I just got this image of a bunch of Force Ghosts sitting around eating so shawarma. So many of them. Just yeah. eating shawarma. Oh. Just, <laughs> <laughs> that's, just the, that's the end of Star Wars. Um, I agree with all of you. We're going to have Star Wars forever. Why would, they, why would they construct a huge land if they're going to be like, all right, we're going to call the series now. It's done. But... If I had to, to be dark for a second and actually be like, okay, this is your hypothetical end of the whole saga, I want the saga to end with no more Force users. There's no more good guy Jedi. There are no more bad Ooh. guys. No more Force users. They are forced in a world of just technology. They have the same, ultimately the same world we have. 
No. No force users. I, I love how you both just pose completely different ideas and both left me with like a major a hole, hole in my heart. Yeah, just, just bam. I mean, because really, there's no good, I really do think there's no good way to end because even if you do take the everybody lives happily ever after approach, it, something still feels missing. I don't. I don't think I can handle either way. I don't think you have to worry about a pair. I know. I think, I think that, I. that hole in your heart is going to be <laughs> yep. just fine because Aww. you're not going to feel it when the apocalypse happens. <laughs> oh, where's that bleach? <laughs> <laughs> One more Twitter question. <laughs> One more, please. And it is by the Chad. Not any Chad. The Chad. Appearances can deceive. Could Benicio del Toro be Thrawn? <laughs> think Jack Napier Joker makeup in the classic Batman 1989. So, Jeremy, what do you think about that question? I, I, I don't think he's Thrawn. No, uh, th that would be amazing if he, he's like, have you ever heard of the healing power of laughter? <laughs> He starts wiping his head. You're like, it's blue. It's blue. Uh, oh, my God. He's thrown. It I looks like old Luke got a little hot under the collar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, I love the Joker so go. much. Dude. I just want Thrawn to close the Joker now. I don't I don't hate this concept, oh. though. I, I I really don't. I like, But if he's like laughing at something and he just starts wiping off his head, there's like blue under it, I think it'd be kind of cool. I think uh, I think you should go up to someone and be like, I'm glad you're dead. <laughs> just walk off. The pen oh. is truly mightier than the sword. Pretty sure none good. of this is happening. No, it's probably not <laughs> happening. I think he's someone else. He's not Thrawn. Yeah, no, he's he's not Thrawn. If you've watched any of uh, Rebels or if you've read the Thrawn book, it it wouldn't make sense for the character. I'm not just talking about you know backstory and who he is. I'm also just talking about how he carries himself and how Del Toro's character has been described. They don't really match at all. And mm -hmm. I mean, just as a character, I could never see Thrawn, you know, ditching his image and even posing as someone else for. And I mean, posing as someone else in that capacity mm -hmm. where it's completely changing his look and everything. I, I, this is not happening. And where is Skywalker? He's at home watching, watching his tights. tights. We, we've seen that movie. Oh, yeah, that's a great one. That's a um, great one. Okay, then, then we'll close with a percentage then. What do you think oh, the no. percentage is that Benicio Del Toro's character is somebody that we've already met in the Star Wars mm, universe? So good. Thrawn or an Ezra or whoever it is. The percentage. Damn. I hate percentages. I hate yeah. scores, numbers. I'll say, they stress uh, me out. I'll say 51%. <laughs> I'll go 50. I'm right go on the mark, damn it. 35. Okay. That sounds like a good number. I hope um, it is. That sounds like a great number. <laughs> All right. Us. Well, now that I have Mark Ellis's approval, I want to thank you guys for watching this episode of Jedi Council. Guys, where can everyone find you? Uh, you can find me at Jeremy Johns on YouTube, Twitter, rest of the internet. You can find my show, Awesome Tacular, on Go90, where Ellis and I, we do some quizzing and we throw some pies and faces. <laughs> it's fantastic. You should be there. And Mark 2D2. And I really hope we get to continue to throw pies in each other's faces until that giant ball of fire engulfs the entire planet Earth. Until then, you guys can get tickets to my stand-up comedy tour, which is ongoing at MarkLSlive.com. I'm in San Antonio this weekend, Jacksonville, Florida next weekend. And you guys can catch me on Twitter and Instagram, at PNEMROF. Collider behind the scenes every Saturday. Again, thank you for giving me the honor of sitting in this seat. And we'll see you next time. May the force be hey with guys, you. If you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.